Alarm systems are a staple of businesses nationwide. When you walk into a building, the door contact separates, making the alarm panel chime. The motion detector sees you, but what about what you don't see? The person in the central station getting a ping and looking at the signals, calling the owner, then the police. Our next talk covers the basic types of alarms, common panels, and contact station procedures, as well as how to exploit them and what you can do to help mitigate the exploits. We present Inside Job, exploiting alarm systems and the people who monitor them. Please welcome Nicholas Kopke. Hello, how's everyone doing tonight? Um, so this talk is going to be covering alarm system basics as well as how we can exploit the procedures of your central station. It's not going to be completely comprehensive. Every central station is different. However, this gives you a little bit of an upper hand when it comes to getting into a building that you know has motion detectors or window and door contacts or glass brick detectors. And it will also allow you to quickly go to a panel and discern it or know enough about a panel to pretend you're a a operator and start fooling the owners of the building. Okay, so we will uh, we will go now to your presentation. Thanks for coming. This is Inside Job, exploiting alarm systems and the people who monitor them. Now a bit about myself. My name's Nick and I'm a student at Pensacola State College. I am also the president of Information Security Network. We are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to expanding security awareness along Florida's Gulf Coast. I've also spent five years as a central station operator. If you'd like to learn more about me, you can OSIT me further, but we have a lot to cover and not a lot of time to do so. Some disclaimers, all opinions here are my own and not of my employer or my nonprofit. And some of the things you see here are dangerous not to yourself but to others and highly illegal. Please do not disrupt em emergency communications. Now on our agenda we have what a central station is, followed by central station procedures and the types of alarm panels that you may commonly come across. Once you have learned about procedures and alarm panels, and how a central station operator sounds and handles signals, we'll go into exploiting how they handle those signals, followed by how to fix these exploits. Now, central stations. What is a central station? Well, it's very similar to a SOC. They handle trouble signals and alarms, and we call the right people to handle it, be it the fire department or the police department or an ambulance. They vary in size. Sometimes you'll have these large call centers like ADT of 50 to 100 people packed inside of a building. Or you'll have mom and pop shops that only have maybe two, three, four people inside of a building. The one constant is they all have to have a minimum of two people inside of them per UL. Your central stations are always going to be open 24 hours, seven days a week. 365 days of the year and also if something happens to a central station there's always a backup so there's always a central station monitoring your central station and if something happens to it all the signals from that from the primary central station roll over to the secondary and vice versa the operators on on a central station shift normally operate between 8 to 12 hours and depending on the central station its size, its service area, it can be constantly busy signal after signal or mind-numbingly slow. And either one of those scenarios pose their own unique challenges. Either way, it results in mentally exhausted central station operators. Now on to our procedures. Now for the purpose of this talk, we're going to be focusing on commercial systems. And I'm not saying that the things in this talk won't work for residential systems. In fact, commercial systems are typically more strict, so they're more likely to work on a residential system. However, it's outside of, it's outside of the scope of this talk. Now we're going to start off with our low priority signals. 
These are trouble signals, like a low battery. All security systems have a backup battery inside the control box, as well as different wireless zones, which have their own self-contained batteries, like your smoke detectors or glass break detectors, window contacts. And, uh, we also have our power fair failures. These happen typically when the power goes out, we'll get a notification that says, hey, AC and DC power has failed, the system's now running on battery power. And so we'll call the, the owner and let them know that, hey, you have a power failure, do you want us to send a technician out there? Typically that's done at the beginning of the next day or at the next business day. Loss of RF supervision. I mentioned earlier about wireless zones, your motion detectors, your glass break detectors, your window contacts. If these fail to communicate with the security system, we'll get a loss of RF supervision. This also includes if someone decides to try and jam that zone out like you see with simply safe door contacts. You'll have someone walk in with an amateur radio, press the button, and the signal's jammed out a loss of OF supervision in that case. Now, a loss of OF supervision is different than an OF signal jam, despite how similar they sound. The OF signal jam deals with the wavelength backup. Now, your wavelength backup is, is a backup system designed for a failover if the phone lines fail to work. So, if we get a phone line failure, we'll get that notification of, hey, the phone lines have failed, but then an alarm goes off and it just says audible burglary, that is your wavelength backup. If the wavelength doesn't come in, then we'll get an RF signal jam. And this is typically caused by a, let's say, a ham operator who is across the street who's accidentally operating on the same frequency as the wavelength backup. You know how radios work. They just kind of scream over each other, and whoever is screaming the loudest wins. And then finally, we have a failed test. Security systems test this once or twice every hour or so, depending on how they're set up. And if it misses its test window, we'll get a notification that says that the system has failed to test with Central Station. And that test signal is how we know the system is operating and that it's alive. For burglary alarms, we have our glass break detectors, and these are typically little microphones that go right next to a window, and they can tell if the glass has been broken. You have motion detectors, which you typically see them along the corners of rooms or on top of a door. And if any motion happens inside the room, be it a person or a bug that's in front of the sensor, then it'll go off and we'll start calling the police. Glass breaks and motion detectors are kind of a troubling combination to have if you're a central station operator. If you see both of them happening at the same time, you likely have an intruder. And some central station operators will actually bypass the usual process of calling the primary number and the secondary number and just go straight to dispatch. Door contacts. Now door contacts and window contacts, it's the same device. Doors are a little bit special though because you have entry and exit doors. Now what this means is that when you're going to open your building for the day, you can only go through one set of doors and those are your entry exit doors. If you go through another set of doors, the alarm's going to sound instantly. Those entry exit doors have a delay between 30 seconds to a minute, and that allows you to get to the security panel. You have a tamper switch, and the tamper switch typically only deals with the control box. So that the control box is the brains of the security system. And if the system's armed, you go to open up that control box, it's going to sound, and you're going to have the police called on you. And panic alarms. Now, panic alarms, if we get a panic alarm, we immediately call the police and we don't call key holders. The on the way, there's nothing you can do about it. And you have two types of panic alarms. You have your silent alarm and your audible alarm. Silent alarm doesn't sound, audible does. 
Technically, you can also include a duress code as a panic. However, that is typically we have you on the line and someone has a gun to your head. You can give us that code and we'll send the police. Or you can input that code into the panel and we'll send the police. For your fire zones, we have smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, and heat and temperature alarms. Now, the smoke detector, we've all seen those go off. It's early in the morning, and you're getting out of the shower, the steam sets off the smoke detector. Or you're cooking breakfast, and the smoke sets off the smoke detector. With fire alarms, we dispatch first. It's not like a residential where we'll call the premises first. We not only have to worry about lives, but we also have to worry about merchandise and data being lost. Carbon monoxide detectors, those are one of the more serious signals because you can't smell carbon monoxide, you can't taste carbon monoxide. By the time you notice that carbon monoxide is in the room, it's already too late. Your heat and temperature alarms, we actually don't dispatch on those. That is typically hey, someone left a freezer door open or your AC in your server room went out and so now your server is thermal throttling. So we, tip, we typically treat those as a trouble signal but they're included here because if that temperature alarm goes off you could lose thousands of dollars in merchandise. And then finally we have the keypad fire. The keypad fire is the equivalent of a panic alarm. So if you don't have a smoke detector or a carbon monoxide detector in the room and next thing you know a fire alarm, well, a fire goes off in the room, you can run to the panel and hit that fire her button on the keypad and it will send the fire department your way. Now these are some special signals that we'll get, and we typically get them at the beginning and end of the day. So a failure to open. This is the building didn't open at the set time that it was meant to. So this means that if your opener for the day didn't open up on time, we call your, we call the manager and we get to snitch on them. Failure to close is the same principle. The building is set to arm at a specific time of day. And if it doesn't arm at that time, then we'll call the premises up, get the name and code of the person inside, and then we'll call the manager up and say that so-and-so is still inside, they're dealing with a customer, and they're going to be an extra 30 minutes. This gives us a little bit of accountability in case that person also decides to just take the entire contents of the register with them when they leave. Your force arm is when someone arms all the zones but one zone. So you may have a problem zone, like a door that won't stay shut, or you have a zone that's falsing. You can arm everything but that one zone and then leave. However, we're still going to call you because it's a liability issue. We need to make sure that you know that you have a weak point in your, sec in your security system. And then finally, we have an invalid opening. This is someone that's opening outside of normal hours. So if you have a business and its normal operating hours are 8 to 8, and we get an opening at 12 a.m., that's going to be a little bit fishy. So we're going to call up there, get their code, and then let the manager know that this person is there after hours. Door processing. You typically only see dual processing with wavelength systems, and that's because you have the wavelength that comes in first because it's coming over the airwaves, and then the digital signal, which is coming over the phone lines or over the internet. And this allows us to process at double the speed that we normally would be able to, because now we have two signals. There is kind of a drawback with dual processing, though, and that is if you have a small central station and you're doing dual processing that is one less operator that can handle a whole stack of alarms. Now onto alarm panels. 
Now, this list of Alolan panels isn't going to be extensive. It's not going to be a list of every single Alolan panel you're going to come out into the field, but it's going to be some fairly common ones. Now, the alarm panels themselves, it's just how you interface the alarm system. Think of it as no more than a keyboard is to your desktop computer, where the alarm panel is communicating with that locked control box in the back. Now, the alarm system itself is going to be communicating over pots most of the time. VoIP is becoming a little bit more common, however, a lot of security companies, they try to point people away from VoIP because it can be somewhat unreliable. You're starting to see Wavelink backups and also cellular uplinks become more common in security systems as well, and those have a nice advantage of being a failover in case of a phone line or internet outage. All security systems, at least for commercial buildings, have a battery backup in case of a power failure and trying to open up that control box in the back or in some cases even trying to tamper with the panel itself may trigger a tamper alarm in which case you'll have the police on you very quickly. Now for our first panel we have the Vista 20 and this is also known as the Ademco 4140XM. Now these are some commands that you can memorize in case you want to impersonate a central station operator or you have access to one of these panels and you want to just know off the top of your head how to disarm it and how to do some basic commands. In this case, code and then one, that will disarm the system. If you want to know some commands to avoid, the one and star combination, three and pound combination, and star and pound combination are going to be panic alarms. So you might want to shy away from those if you don't want the police on your location. And if you want to arm the system and cover your tracks when you leave, if you're going to input your code and then one of your arming keys. So your arming keys in this case are going to be 2, 3, and 4. 2 is your away key. That's your normal arming it for the night. No one's in the building. Arms your exterior and interior zones. 3 is going to be stay, that is, you have an animal in the building or someone staying overnight, and that arms just the perimeter zones, and 4 is max, that is, it arms all the zones, and there's no delay. Now, I mentioned codes, with the Vista 20, you have 3 of them. You have your master code, and these can perform all the alarm functions, and you only get one of them per system. You have your user code, and these can arm and disarm the system. However, there's some limitations. They can't add or delete users. They can't program scheduled events or view the event log. You can also have different functions for user codes. So you can set them as arm or disarm only. You can set them as a duress code, or you can set it, set it up as a guest code. And the guest code can only disarm the system if it was used to arm the system. And then we have the installer code. Now, this is kind of unique to the Vista 20 in this talk because when we get to the radionics of Bosch panels later, you're not going to be getting access to the installer code, and I'll cover that when we get there. But the installer code allows you to enter program mode, and it can't disarm the system unless it was used to arm it. However, it can use all security functions. Your default installer code if you have access to a unarmed Vista 20 is 4112. And if you put 4112 into the panel, followed by 800, it puts you into program mode. Now the program mode is the alarm equivalent to sudo on the Linux desktop. And provided that the security company was lazy during installation or if it was a self-install, then you won't have to do things like power down the system. And by power down, I mean you know, cut power to the system and also cut off the backup battery. And if you're really lucky, it might not be locked out completely. If it's not locked out and you don't require the power down, then you have access to things like disabling the RF jam notification 
or disabling the wavelength backup entirely, resetting the primary and secondary phone line numbers, or just completely factory resetting the system. Now, here we have the Radionics 2112 and 2212, and there's, there's some slight variations on the different panels. They're all typically the same thing, though. For these two panels, you just put your code in and it will disarm the system. You have a little bit of a leeway with the alarm sounding and putting your code in. So if you set the alarm off, say you go through the wrong door, you have a few minutes, well, uh, not a few minutes, but maybe like 10 seconds to 30 seconds to get to the panel and disarm it before it's able to dial out to central. Have your nine key that's going to arm all the zones. T zero. It's going to arm your perimeter zones. And if you want to reset the system in the case of a system trouble, three code who is going to reset the system. On the twenty two twelve, you'll have A, B, and C keys, and one of these is going to be a panic alarm. And I can't tell you which button it is because that's going to be programmed by the installer of the security system, so I wouldn't recommend going and playing with those three keys. And I mentioned earlier that on the radionics and Bosch panels, you're not really going to get you're not really going to be able to get access to that installer mode. And the reason why is you have to flip a standby switch in the control box. And then once you do that, these panels are meant to be programmed remotely. So we have remote access management, we call it ramming the system. And it allows us to just remote into the panel and program it from central. Now for the 4112, 6112, your code's gonna be code and enter, command 47 is gonna reset the system, and your panic is going to be command and nine. If you want to change the code, at least for the 6112, it's going to be command 5, your old code, and enter, then new code, enter, and then new code, enter again. For your radionics and Bosch 4512s, 5512s, and 8512s, this arm is going to be your code and enter. And if you want to arm it up afterwards, you're going to do that same command. And these are the panels that normally are going to have that cellular backup and the wavelength. Now, this is also when Radionics and Bosch kind of got together. So you'll see these panels labeled as either Radionics or most likely now Bosch. For the Radionics 6412, also known as the Bosch D6412, you have that C button. When you hold that, that's going to be your panic alarm. If you want to reset the system, it's going to be your command 47. And if you want to disarm it, it's just the code, no command key needed. And to change the master code, it's command 55, old code, and then new code twice. For your 7212, these are also known as the Bosch D1255. Your panic alarm is going to be command 9, the system resets command 47, disarming it is going to be your code and then the enter key, and then command plus 1, 2, or 3 will arm the system. And you see your arming keys up there, all, so all the zones, instant is going to be all the zones and no delay, and your 3 is going to be your in the building. And if you're going to change the code, it's going to be command 55, old code, new code twice. Now that we've gotten through the panels, let's go through exploiting the operators. So there's a few ways to get information about a security system without actually entering the building. And there's also a few ways of bypassing those alarms without doing the old tricks like the uh, com compressed air in front of a motion detector, for example. 
This talk is going to focus on central stations that use live people for dispatch. There are some central stations that will use an automated system that completely bypass the central station process and go straight to the police department. You're typically going to see these with larger central stations and not your smaller locally owned ones. So the first thing I want to go over is alarm certificates. These are provided by your central station to your insurance company and this allows you to get a little bit of a lower rate on your insurance for the building. These will also tell them, say, what type of panel you're using. Do you have a wavelength backup? Do you have a smoke detector, carbon monoxide detector, heat detector, motion detectors, windows, well, it's the whole kit and caboodle. It won't tell them where they are, but it's nice to know that you have these things so you can plan accordingly later. And what makes this so awful is that most of the time you don't require a code to access it. You can just say that you're the user or you're the insurance company and press that on behalf of the user and you'll likely get it. Weather conditions. Now, certain weather conditions can cause false alarms that you can take advantage of in an engagement. For example, thunderstorms. Lightning and thunder, this combination often will cause glass breaks and motions to false. Remember earlier how I said that if you have a glass break and a motion going off at the same time, you may have someone skipping primary and secondary and going straight to dispatch. Thunderstorms, that's much less likely to happen, and instead, we're going to call the owner and say, hey, there's a storm going on in the area. Do you want us to disregard these signals for the night? Or the owner themselves will ask that. And so what will happen is those two zones will go off constantly through the night and you have an in. So you can go ahead and you can start breaking windows and crawling through them if need be. Wind. So if you live in a windy area, what's going to happen is the doors are going to rattle, windows may rattle, and something may blow open, and just that rattling by itself may actually set the door contact off. So what may happen is a user may bypass a door or window, or if it's falsing constantly, the, uh, the person may be asked they want to disregard that signal for the night. And so if you're walking around the building and you notice a loose door uh, and it's just like rattling around, it may be bypassed if the wind is particularly high and it's just constantly moving. That might be a safe way in. I would keep in mind, though, that you still have to deal with interior zones. But if that door is moving, it may also set off a motion detector. So a little something to keep in mind if you want a way in to get to the panel. Window conditions. So frost, frost forming on the outside of windows, that sound, it very much sounds like glass breaking and it will confuse glass break detectors. In addition to that, you have condensation. So you'll typically see these on windows in the winter where the frost will form and then it will thaw and then the water will get in between the contacts. So you have a little bit of adhesive on the back of the contact, water will get there, and then it'll freeze again, and then thaw. More water will come in and freeze again, and this happens a few times, and it pops the sensor off. So what you can do is you can go up to the window, and you can try to open it, and if it's particularly freezing outside, it, it may be chopped up to just weather conditions. The cold has finally popped the sensor off the window, and you may be able to get inside that way. Your summer conditions. Humidity is here. It's not one that you would want to count on because you're trigger triggering a fire alarm. However, it's good to know in case you leave a door open and that humidity may set off a smoke detector, so you may get the wrong attention to your building. 
Now, the one you do want to pay attention to, though, is extreme heat. So if you live in South Florida or Arizona or Texas or any place that the heat regularly gets up into the hundreds, that extreme heat may cause the adhesive on those contacts to start to melt. And if they weaken to a certain point, they'll just fall off the door. And this is a common enough problem even up here in North Florida. We normally deal with this three, four times a year where the sensor just falls off because of the heat. Bugs and rodents. Before I get too far into this, I highly advise that you do not release live animals into a building. As hilarious as the thought is, you're putting those animals at risk, and you're also putting merchandise at risk, people potentially at risk. Just, it's in general just a bad idea. However, if you know a place has a bug problem, like a warehouse they constantly have an exterminator over, you can use that as an in because rats will set off motion detectors. Spiders and roaches crawling along a motion detector will set it off. This is also an easy scapegoat if you want to impersonate the alarm company. Hey, you can call them up before you go in and say, hey, we've noticed that you, your security system has been falsing lately. Do you, you want us to disregard the motion detector in the warehouse for the night? And that's a good excuse to have those motion detectors disarm so you only have to worry about your exterior zones. Pets. Now, pets are more common than you might think. That you typically see these in in small businesses, in medium-sized businesses. Maybe a, a employee is keeping a pet inside the warehouse for the night. But if you see an animal inside of the building, that normally means that this the interior zones are disarmed, motion detectors are disabled, or that they have just disarmed everything for that night. Now, different animals have different characteristics. Dogs, for example, the barking will commonly set off glass brick detectors. In addition, if they see any activity outside, they'll go, they'll put their paws up on the windows and it looks adorable. However, it will also set off the door contacts and the glass bricks. The walking around will also set off motions. So that's why the motion detectors are commonly disabled. Cats. They're just normally setting off motion detectors. They don't make a lot of noise. The only time they're going to set off a glass break is if they actually break something because, you know, well, cats at 4 a.m. Spring forward. Now, I the spring forward is a nightmare for central station operators. The reason for this is some security systems and monitoring software that goes with them it doesn't exactly take the time change to account. So what happens is, I mentioned that failed test earlier. Well, if you have your failed test, well, you have your test at 2 a.m., right? And set the test once every hour. If it goes from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., the security system is going, hey, man, what the fuck happened? And it's going to start screaming. Not through the sirens, but at the operator. This is going to happen to every single alarm system that you monitor, which means that poor operator has a stack of 100 signals that they have to go through. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to miss that RF signal jam. They're going to miss that loss of RF supervision, the power failure, the low battery, and that gives you some opportunity to do some setup without having the owner notified because they're too busy trying to get through a stack of one, two, three hundred signals to worry about that low battery. Impersonating Central. This is a fun one and it's not too terribly hard to do because every place that has a security system also has a sticker on the door that says, hey, we're monitored by the security company. Here's our phone number. So you take that phone number and you spoof it and then you call the owner of the building up or the manager and you say that there's a small trouble with the system. And I mean small trouble. Don't go claiming that there's an alarm because they may go, oh, there's nothing wrong here. This is a crank call. 
or they may want you to send the police, which is much worse. Because then your cover's blown. So stick to phone line blips and power failures. That typically will get you the codes that you want. And speaking about codes, you typically have two types of codes that you're going to receive. If you get a numeric code, that's likely going to be the panel code to disarm the system. If you get a password, that's going to be more of an administrative code that you can use to call central up and impersonate the user and then try to add a code into the account later. Now that code change will likely take effect the next business day, but now you have a way in. One thing you can do if you do get a password is you can say, hmm, I'm not seeing that on your account. Do you have a four digit code? And that will sometimes also get you a numeric code. However, I wouldn't count on it and you're just as likely to just piss off your victim as you are to get a numeric code. Wavelink jamming. Just straight up, don't do this. Now, not only is it seriously illegal, not just because you're violating the FCC rules, but also you're violating emergency communications, you're going way out of scope because wavelength backups also act as repeaters for other wavelength backups. So jamming one is going to take down an entire network of them. So you're going to have a similar situation to a spring forward where all the security systems that are connected to that one node are going to come in as RF signal jam. Now, wireless sensor jamming, we've seen this before with SentrySafe and the door contacts getting jammed by a little HT ham radio. If you're going to do this, use as much power as you need because you don't want to take out all the zones at once. You just want to take out only the ones you need. And you also don't want to affect the security system of the person next door. This is also a good reason to impersonate Central. So what what you're going to do is you're going to sit out in your car, you're going to hit the button on your little ham radio system, and the owner's going to get a call from Central saying, hey, we're noticing a loss of RF supervision, and can we get your code? You're going to wait about five minutes and then call them as Central and say, hey, we're noticing a loss of RF supervision, and the owner is going to go, hey, you guys just called me five minutes ago. Oh, yes, well, what's happening is we're training a employee, and, and they accidentally called you by mistake. We still need your code, though. And you'll, you'll get the code, more than likely, because they just want you off the line. Police disregard. This is a risky one, but it's a common one. So what happens is the security system is falsing to the point that the police are just considering it a nuisance and it's refusing to go they are refusing to go to the premises. This is kind of a risky one because depending on your police department, they may stake out the area, the owner of the business may get fined. This is most definitely not part of your pen test terms of engagement. And once you get in, though, once you execute this and the police stop coming, there's nothing Central can really do about it. Yeah, they can call the cops for the logs. However, what's happening is the police are telling them, yeah, a sergeant said that we're not responding to alarms out there. And so now you're kind of free to just rob the place blind as if the system was disarmed, so long as you have sufficient earplugs to you know, deaden out the siren. Destructive entry. Well, okay, so this is the fun one for everyone here. Not all businesses have a full suite of sensors, and if you did your recon, say, called in for an alarm certificate or you physically case a joint, you can determine what sensors the building has or does not have. So, say, you got your alarm, certif you got your alarm certificate, and it does not say glass brick detectors or motion detectors on it, which again is more common than you might think despite most buildings having those. 
you can go up to the window now, knowing that there's no glass break and no motion detectors, and, you know, chuck a brick through it. This is a little bit risky though, because not only is it dangerous because of broken glass, and not only is it loud because the sound of broken glass being extremely suspicious, but you also have door contact, or not door, but window contacts on that window. So if you jostle that window frame a little bit, it may set the alarm off. Something to keep in mind if you decide to go breaking windows. Disconnecting the phone lines. If you're going to do this, you might want to make sure that it's even worth the time by determining if there is a cellular uplink or a wavelink backup. If one of those is in use, you'll probably want to jam it or just think of another way to prevent signals from getting into central. Oh, now the alarm system may be using VoIP instead of POTS. Now this isn't too big of an issue because you know, a lot of places are just swapping over to VoIP in general. Or well, if you do a little bit of network reconnaissance, you may be able to just kick the security system off the network. Now, if you disconnect the phone lines, what's going to happen is we'll receive a communications failure, we'll call the business owner, and that'll be that. No police will come, nothing like that. We just needed to notify someone that we can't receive signals from the place, and that leaves you kind of free to disrupt the place. Now, one thing I should note though is just because the phone lines are disconnected doesn't mean that the sirens still aren't going to go off. So once again, bring some earplugs if you're going to do this. Cutting yourself a new door. So this is something that it sounds silly. This has happened. Someone did the recon. They noticed that this warehouse didn't have motion detectors on the inside. And so they brought the van up with a circular saw and they cut themselves a hole into the wall of the building and just robbed them of everything that was inside that warehouse. You're not likely going to get approval for this on your pen test, but it's a fun thing to think about and if, again, you're so inclined and you think you can get away with it, well, the warehouse is your oyster now. Now, remediation. How are we going to fix all these flaws in the central station monitoring process? Well, it starts with the users first. See, we need to educate our users on security principles before they get their alarm systems. They need to understand access control, because that's primarily what security systems are, it's access control. Each user needs to have their own code, and we need to know who that code is assigned to. So it shouldn't be manager opener code. I should have a actual name to associate with that code. And only the owner of the security system should be able to change codes. In addition to that, only certain people should be able to open after hours. So I mentioned this with the invalid opening. And if a certain people, or if certain people open up after hours, we'll call the manager. That's not universally the case. Some businesses will just allow any person to open up after hours because they trust their employees a little too much, and we've seen it all too often, that the register is robbed blind or the missing merchandise because they trusted their employees too much. If you get a random call from your central station and you're not 100% sure it's them, just hang up, don't give them code, don't entertain them. Just hang up and call a known good number for your central station. We're not going to laugh at you, explain the situation, and I 100% promise that we will be appreciative because we don't want to see you get robbed. We don't want to see data stolen and destroyed. We want to make sure that you're safe. If you're going to require a alarm certificate, before you ask for a for a alarm certificate, you need to tell your central station that only I should be able to get alarm certificates, not the insurance company, and I need to request code before I do so. 
because you don't want that free information out for any person to come in and get just by impersonating you or your insurance company. And finally, be kind to your operators. If you're known to abuse them, what's going to happen is they're going to be afraid to call you for low batteries, or power failures, or even alarms. And that gives thieves if some added precious seconds, and I do mean precious, every second counts, to get away from the building before we call police. Thank you, and now on to the Q&A. alarm systems and the people who monitor them with Nicholas Cook. Nicholas, thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, we've got a little bit of time for uh, maybe a couple of questions. Um, there's some good ones coming in. Uh, a member of the audience asks, are there any good books, websites, etc., about these things that you could recommend? So the best, thing, the best things I could uh, advise you to read up on are the installation manuals for the alarm panels that I mentioned at the talk as well as, as looking through the UL regulations Thanks. for central station operators. Great. Uh, another question from the audience. Concerning Wavelink, what sort of regional setup is typically used? Is it just a single tower or repeaters? Or are they hosted as part of another service? So with Wavelink, each Wavelink system is also a repeater. So you have your central station wavelength receiver, and then each system that has a wavelength backup will check in with that receiver and they check in with each other. They're all repeaters to each other. That's why when one goes down, we're in such a scramble to get it back up and broadcasting because we all rely on those repeater networks. If one goes down, then, and it may affect multiple systems, and that may cascade. We actually had one issue where one got hit by lightning, and we spent six hours trying to find the one that got hit, because everything was coming in. It was a nightmare. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, a very good question here. Uh, to what extent do police understand these things about alarm systems? In other words, are they generally naive enough to fall for simple tricks like triggering multiple alarms to fatigue them from responding? It depends on your police department. So some are, and in fact, here in Pensacola, we'll often get like two, maybe three maximum calls to a single area before the sergeant just refuses to go out there anymore. Because a lot of police departments and sheriff's departments, they treat alarm systems as low priority signals compared to everything else. So if they think that something is just falsing, they'll just refuse to go out there because they don't want to deal with it and they have better things to do. Indeed. Um, we'll, we'll have to leave it about there, but uh, really quick, uh, where can people go to get more info on, uh, on the work you've done here and uh, get in touch with you if they wish? So if you want to get in touch with me, I am on Twitter at SawOnLazy. And I'll be in the live stream chat for a few more minutes. I'll also be on Radio Statler tomorrow at noon. Excellent. Okay. Um, Nicholas Cook, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.